Easter is six weeks away. How fast has this year gone so far? Someone tell me how many people we're believing God for by Easter. 800 by Easter. 800 by Easter. And if you're a first time or the reason that we're believing God for, hello, the reason we're believing God, we're going for it. Hold on. We got a new lighting rig. It's okay. It's okay. We're, we're, we're working the kinks out right now. The reason that we're believing God for 800 people by Easter is not just because we want to be able to say we have 800 people to go to our church. That's trashy. Who cares about being able to say stuff like that? The reason that we're believing for 800 by Easter is because 800 means 800 lives changed, 800 stories about encounters with God, 800 people saturated in community. And so that said, I just want to make sure you guys know, like when every person who regularly attends Overflow Church on a Sunday, not when it's raining and you have a million excuses to not be here, when everyone's here that's normally here on a Sunday, Y'all know we're already sitting at right at the 600 mark? How cool is that? That means two things. Number one, it means 800 isn't such a stretch when you put it into that context. And then number two, it means there are still 200 people waiting for you to invite them, waiting for you to invite them to church, waiting for you to invite them into your life, waiting for you to simply have a conversation with them that could change everything that they know right now as it goes with God, as it goes with their life, as it even goes with their family. And I say all this as a reminder to say, don't slow down. Do not slow down. I know there's lots of stuff happening in the world right now. I know we're getting busy. I know it's tax season. I know there's a lot of stuff coming up, but don't slow down. Someone remind me what our phrase for 2022 is. Someone tell me, shout it out loud. Come on. Our word for the year is attack mode. And for once again, for any of our first timers, if you're not sure what it is, I just even asked from our church every year, we ask God for a prophetic word or for a prophetic phrase just to kind of point us in the direction for the year, to mark the year. And this year, that phrase is attack mode, which simply means that regardless of the gas prices, regardless of whether it's raining outside, regardless of the stock market, regardless of what's happening in the world, regardless of what we can see in the natural Regardless of any of that, we are hereby done operating out of survival mode. That is not who we are anymore. Come hell or high water, we are dedicated to seeing a move of God take place in West Tennessee. We are dedicated. We're ready to do whatever it takes. We're done sitting around and hoping that things are just going to magically change. And we've decided to become the agents of that change in our community, in our families, with our coworkers, and all over the northwestern region of West Tennessee. That's who we are. That's what we're going to do, whatever it takes, however long it takes. And even if it looks different than what we initially thought it was going to look like when we started this thing. And one of the many things that we've been doing to prepare ourselves and our church for what we're believing God to do uh, in our area is we have been in a series of talks entitled Stronger, Better Core, where we are using the first part of 2022 to talk through one of our church's brand new core values every single week in order to strengthen and reinforce the core of who we are, what we do, and why we do it as a church collectively, while also hopefully bringing a little bit of practical language uh, as to what it looks like to follow Jesus individually. And I'll be up front with you. Today, the passage of Scripture we're going to start out with is relatively obscure, and it will uh, likely not be our main source of wisdom and revelation that we're drawing from today, but it is going to be a source of wisdom and revelation. It's going to be where we start. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, or as as our media director, Mr. Emmett Sloan, might say, the book of Ecclesiasticals. Ecclesiastes. If you're not sure where Ecclesiastes is, if you open your Bible right to the middle section, you'll likely hit Psalms, and you go Psalms, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes is right after Proverbs. I believe we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and you can follow along with me on the screen. Ecclesiastes 3, starting in verse number 1. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. And I want you to pay very close attention to verse number four. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Now, in other words, 
this verse is being really kind of practical with us. There's an appropriate time to be sad. There's an appropriate time to grieve. There's an appropriate time to hurt. Uh, that is good, that is healthy, that is necessary if you want to move forward in certain moments of your life. And I think that people and even Christians are starting to kind of understand this better and better as time goes on. But what I don't want you to do and what we have the tendency of doing when we read that verse is we put all of our focus on the crying and grieving part of the verse. And that's what I don't want you to do. Because these verses are not just about crying and grieving. If you pay real close attention and you look at it closely... They are equally acting as reminders that there are also appropriate times to laugh and dance and have fun and maybe even throw a party every now and then. And so with that wisdom uh, was the inspiration for the ninth core value uh, that we're going to talk about today, which as usual is also the title for our message, which is this. We at Overflow Church, we are party starters. (laughs) We are party starters. If you hang out around here for more than a week or two, Uh, it will become blindingly obvious that we are, dare I say, a little different (laughs) than other churches. We are too charismatic for the conservatives. We are too conservative for the charismatics. I'm way too young to be the preacher. Our town is way too small for a church like this. We don't dress up like we're supposed to. We wear hats. We're way too loud. And Lord knows we let women speak way too much around here. Yada, yada, yada. The list goes on. But of all the characteristics that God has given us and marked us with as a church, one of my personal favorites is that we always have been and we always will be party starters, which simply means that we prioritize having fun. We prioritize having fun. We laugh, we dance, we sing, we jump, we smile, and we're really loud in case you haven't already noticed. In fact, sometimes we're probably too loud, but up front. We don't apologize for any of it because as sinners saved by grace, you better believe that we're going to make the most out of our opportunity at New Life in God. Come on, is anybody else thankful for the fresh start that you got to make for God's mercies that are new every single morning? Buddy, I know I am, and that's why I ain't about to take this life for granted. I'm going to celebrate it. Every opportunity that I have, I'm going to celebrate it. And yes, yes, yes. I will have a chance to live again in eternity when Jesus comes back and we're raised from the dead and he establishes new creation and the new heavens and the new earth are made and eternal life is gonna be great. And while I'm excited for eternal life, there is also this life that I'm living right here, right now. And I will not take for granted my one opportunity that I have at this life. I'm going to milk it for everything that it's worth. And I know we just read Ecclesiastes 3 and it's kind of a weird you know, verse to read in a sermon like this, because if you've ever gone to a funeral, then you'll know that this is, these are verses that people bring out of funerals all the time. And that's for good reason, because it's always a good reminder, like for, for Christians, a lot of time, it's good for us to be uh, reminded about the fact that spiritual maturity is not the ability to suppress sadness. Just so you know, like that's not an official note today. You might want to write it down. Spiritual maturity is not measured in your ability to suppress sadness and to just decide that you're going to be happy all the time. Spiritual maturity is found in the ability to embrace your sadness and to take that sadness to God. That is true. That is good. That's healthy. We need to know that stuff. But once again, I want to note that these verses are not just about sadness and grieving. They are equally about the importance of smiling and laughing and going out of your way to have some fun every now and then. You guys know that you're allowed to enjoy your life, right? Oh, you know that? I know you haven't heard a preacher say this before, right? Because preachers don't say stuff like this. But you're allowed to enjoy your life, even though church people, myself included, I'm, I'm a culprit of this, even though church people are historically boring, own it, and lame, and rigid, and uptight. And even though you will most certainly be overwhelmed and stressed and tired and feel like you're pushed to the max sometimes, and even though horrible things like death and divorce and war and hatred leave us traumatized, and even though bad things happen to good people, and even though prayers do not always get answered, and even though life just kind of generally sucks every now and then, guess what? You are absolutely allowed to still be happy, have fun, and enjoy your life anyways. You are. You are. Matter of fact, in this kind of the name of having fun, letting loose, and enjoying your life, on the count of three, I would like for you to let out just kind of like a rowdy, rambunctious, Ric Flair style, woo! Is that okay? Would you guys do that for me? Okay. Matter of fact, I'm not even going to ask you. If you are okay with this, on the count of three, hit me with a woo. One, two, three. Woo! That felt good. Now look at the person you're sitting next to and smile. It's good in your big teeth. Smile like that. That feels nice, doesn't it? 
You're allowed to let loose every now and then, church people. You're allowed to have fun. You're allowed to not be boring. Guess what? Not only is it okay, I would go as far as to say it's Christ-like. What? It's Christ-like. I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm the preacher, so really, well, I'm supposed to be standing up here and reminding you of how bad you are and how sinful you are and how much you need God's grace. And all oh, that's true, that's true, that's true, that's true, that's great. And I know, I know, I know. The way some of y'all grew up, I'm supposed to be standing up here trying to scare you into following Jesus, talking about how horrible hell is. But did you know that having fun is really godly? Having fun is really godly. I believe it so much that I made it an official note today. What a great note. How deep is that? Having fun is really godly. And I know someone right now, you're rethinking your decision to visit Overflow Church this morning. Because you came to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and this 29-year-old with his half-done 800 shirt, not to, not to throw any shade on the person that made it, but it was just kind of like a thought. It was just like a, the day before process. This, this guy up here preaching in Nikes is trying to tell you that it's really godly to have fun. Like I know that's not why you came to church, but before you leave mad at me, before you roll out of here, before hearing the whole sermon, before you go and post mean things about me and Overflow Church on your Facebook wall, would it surprise you to know that Jesus also endorses the importance of having fun? I want you to like think about it for a second. Not only is Jesus the creator of everything good that has ever happened, the father of lights, the, from whom every good and perfect gift comes from, not only did Jesus give you the ability to have fun, give you literally the biological makeup where you could enjoy fun. Not only does Psalm 45 and Hebrews 1 both call Jesus literally the happiest, most joy-filled person to ever walk the planet, but have you ever stopped to think about the way that Jesus stepped onto the scene initially, the way, have you ever stopped to think about the very first public miracle that Jesus ever performed and the events surrounding that miracle? If not, let's read it real quick. Look at John 1. I'm not gonna give you time to turn there. You're just gonna have to follow along. John 2, I lied to you. We're gonna start in verse number one. This is what it says. The, the next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mom was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to this celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, hey, baby, they, they ran out of drinks. They ran out of wine. And he's like, uh, mom, that's... That's not really my problem. I came to do other things other than provide people with drinks. My time hasn't come yet. But his mom just kind of went ahead and told the servant. She said, you know what? I know that's, that's what he said right now, but just do whatever he tells you to do. And so standing there nearby, there were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. And so Jesus, at his mom's beckoning request, told the servants, fill the jars with water. And so when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremonies. And so servants followed his instructions. And when the master of the ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over and he gives you some really, really good party advice right here. He says, wait, a host of a good party serves the best wine first. And then when everyone's had a lot to drink, a.k.a. when everyone's <laughs> buzzing a little bit, he brings out the less expensive wine. This is just practical advice. Like you give the, the worst tasting drinks to people who aren't gonna be able to taste it as well. He said, but you've kept the best wine until now. And this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time that Jesus revealed his glory. It was the first public miracle that he ever performed and his disciples then believed in him. Now, to be fair, this is an incredibly important passage of scripture, and there are many more important and theologically rich discussions that go along with this passage of scripture, discussions that we will have around here at some point in the future. But today, I want you to hear this and just start using your God-given imagination for just a second, all right? Jesus could have been doing anything on this fine evening. He could have been prepping for a sermon. He could have been healing the sick. He could have been at home washing clothes. He could have been debating a Pharisee. But instead, he chose to spend this evening hanging out with his buddies and likely doing the equivalent of the Jewish cha-cha slide. Instead of doing any of that, he could have performed 
any miracle as his first one. He could have raised someone from the dead. He could have flown. He could have walked through a wall. He could have walked on water, but he didn't. The first miracle that he chose to perform was providing drinks for people to keep a party going. How insane is that? This is the God that you serve. And some of y'all like get offended when I say that, but I love it because you can't get offended at me. I guess you're just gonna get offended at him because he's the one that did it. I'm not making this stuff up. It's in your Bible. And the only reason that I point it out is so that we can start the journey of learning how to view Jesus for who he really is rather than viewing him as this rigid, uptight guy who only likes praying and reading the Torah and preaching sermons. Let's start viewing Jesus for who he was in reality. The God man who, yes, loved prayer and he loved scripture and he loved preaching, but who also loved hanging with his boys, having some fun, and enjoying his life a little bit. That is who Jesus was. In fact, look at John 10, 10, referring to this life now, and that's important, don't miss that. Referring to this life. I know a lot of times when we think Jesus is talking about life and life more abundantly, we think what he's referring to is the eternal life that we're gonna experience. And while that is true, Jesus also is referring to this life currently right now. And this is what he says pertaining to your life right now on earth, John 10, 10. The thief, which is not Jesus, comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I, meaning I ain't the thief, and my job description is not to steal, to kill, or to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have life more abundantly. Or in other words, I came so that you could have a more rich and satisfying life right here and right now than you could ever have without me. A, more, a, a life full of purpose. A life full of destiny, a life full of hope, a life full of peace, a life full of passion, a life full of righteousness, a life full of confidence, a life full of God. That's what Jesus came to give you, to provide for you right now. And up front, that does, certainly does not mean that he came to give you a perfect pain-free life. Man, even right now, like in the story, when Jesus performed this miracle at the wedding, things were not going good. Things were far from perfect. People we're still being ravaged by the curse of sin in an infinite number of ways. People all over the world were still dying of sicknesses and uh, hunger and violence. In fact, God himself stepped in and interacted with humanity and we missed it. And not only did we miss it, we killed him. Things are not going good at this point in the game. In fact, I would go on record to say it was probably one of the most dark seasons of humanity ever. And Jesus being God, he was fully aware of all that. And yet he still goes out of his way to help throw a party and enjoy his life a little bit. And if that's the case, that means that God likes it when you have fun and enjoy your life too. In fact, look at John 15 real quick. John 15, 11, referring to his love for us. Jesus says this, I've told you these things. What things? I've told you about my love. I've told you about the coming kingdom that's at hand. I've told you about the righteousness of God that you're about to inherit. I've told you about these things, not just so you'll go to heaven. Yeah, he's concerned about that. But he says, I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy, like now, so that your joy will overflow. No pun intended there. He says, I've told you about these things so that you'll be happy. The gospel message is so that you can experience some happiness. I've mentioned this before, but you want to know what I am ready for preachers to stop saying as soon as possible? I am so fed up and I'm done with hearing sermons where preachers say things like, hey, let me channel my, my inner like old Pentecostal guy. Hold on. God didn't come to make you happy. God came to make you holy. And then that's the part where the organ's supposed to come in and people go, ah, and he goes, yeah, somebody lift up a shout. I get it. It preaches good and people clap. And I kind of understand the intent of that statement, but I hate it because it's not even true. I want to be like, where did you hear that from? Are you reading the same Bible I am? Because according to my Bible, Jesus said, I told you these things so that you'll overflow with joy, so that you'll overflow with happiness. God did not just come to make you holy. He certainly came so that you could experience joy right now. He certainly came. And don't get me wrong, man. Is the happiness that Jesus is talking about, is it different than probably our idea of happiness? For sure. Is it different than what we're expecting, than what we're asking for? For sure. 
But, but God still came so that, he, so that he could provide your life with some much needed joy. Let's get honest. Joy is much needed in your life. I've seen some of y'all's Facebook posts. It's much needed. Some of y'all need to get out and go to the, like the skating rink or something. I don't know. Listen to the, the, what, the Macarena and do, what's the little thing? What's the, the game called where they put the pole and you go into the pole? The limbo. You need to go do the limbo and take your wife out on a date and loosen up a little bit. God wants you to experience a little bit of happiness, man. Use your brain for a second. Use your brain, the one that God gave you. Why, do, why was all this created? Because God wanted you to enjoy it. He created the heavens and the earth and the garden and the animals and like plants and water and burgers and tacos and all that stuff for your enjoyment. He created all of this because he loves you. Like, yeah, God wants you to be productive and he wants you to, to be responsible and he wants you to spread the word and he wants you to help people. But like, it's not just the productive things that matter to God. It's also the fun things that matter to God. God cares about you having fun. God cares about you enjoying your life. Don't get me wrong. Even though bad things do still happen, you need to remember, go to the book of Genesis, okay? That was never God's intent. He never wanted that to happen to you. He never wanted that for humanity. That's why he warned Adam and Eve to not eat the fruit, to not sin against him. Because God did not ever initially intend for you to experience pain and suffering and heartache and horrible times. That was not his original intent. Now, he gave us the ability to choose otherwise. But originally, that is not what God wanted for you. And you want to know why? It's super simple. God wants his kids to enjoy their lives because he loves his kids. Man. How nuts is that? For any of our parents in the room, like any good father, God gets enjoyment when his kids are happy. How many of you and your kids are playing at the park and they're happy and they're laughing, you're just like, this isn't why they were created. They need to be doing work. They need to be crying. I don't know. I mean, like, how weird is that? God gets enjoyment out of you getting enjoyment. God enjoys uh, when his kids laugh in, until their stomachs hurt. When was the last time you laughed until you cried? Seriously. I mean, what, aren't, is anybody else done in here with the fake like service level laughing that you have to do when you're having like a conversation with someone and they say something that's not really funny and you don't really like your life and you're like, <laughs> and you walk away and you're like, I still feel dead on the inside right now for this conversation. When was the last time you laughed until your stomach hurt? When was the last time you sprayed milk out of your nose because you were laughing so hard? You know God likes that. You know God likes when you go on vacation. You know all the pictures you post when you go on vacation with your kids, the pictures that no one actually looks at. But, you know, it's like them playing in the sand. And you have 25 pictures of your vacation. And they only see the first five on Facebook. And they, outside of the people who like every picture on Facebook. Shout out to the people who like all 25 pictures individually. <laughs> Matthew Page liked all Seven or eight of my pictures individually last, not last night. And I was like, man, that is dedication right now. Outside of the 5% of people who do that, most people don't even care about those pictures, but you do. You like seeing your kids happy. You like seeing them play in the sand. You like seeing them go to the beach. Guess what God does too? He likes when you go grab pizza with your friends. He likes when you go on hikes. He likes when you go fishing. He likes when you play basketball. He likes when you dance. He likes when you fall in love. He likes when you make really great memories. God cares about his kids, just like any other good father cares about their kids. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not a dad right now, so I can't, I guess I can't speak into this situation, but as it goes with my own experience, typically speaking, good dads like when their kids are enjoying their lives. Good dads like enjoy when their kids are having fun. And at the same time, I have to say this, I have to preface this, because I know me, and Lord knows, I know y'all. Please don't hear this message about God delighting in you having fun and use it as an excuse or use it as me giving you permission to go dive headlong into full-on rebellion and get wasted and hook up with people and commit a whole bunch of different sins in the name of what well, God wants me to have fun. Obviously, that is not what we're talking about. Let's get it back into context, man. Jesus, he had fun. He went to the wedding. He probably danced with his buddies. And at the same time, he was performing miracles. He was 
actively operating in the gifts of the Spirit, if your idea of fun is not also conducive to the power and presence of God at all times, it's not fun you're craving, it's sin that you're craving. That is still wrong. That is still not okay. Christians are still expected to embrace lifestyles of holiness and purity. We're still expected to be set apart. That's good. That's good teaching. That's right. That's godly. And at the same time, it's also godly for you to have fun and for you to live your life to the fullest. It's also godly for you to have fun and for you to live your life to the fullest. And this is why one of our core values is that we are party starters around here because Jesus was fun. And you can't separate out the teachings of Jesus from the life of Jesus and from the personality of Jesus and from the ways of Jesus. You can't, you can't melt it down into words on a paper that is like an instruction manual. No, you cannot separate out the Bible from Jesus's actual existence and his personality and the things that he did. Jesus was fun. He's God. That means he understands fun better than we ever could. Jesus was happy. Jesus was the life of the party in nearly every single room that he walked into. And as people who claim to be individuals that are molded and shaped after his image, as people who claim to be the body of who? The body of Christ. The body of Christ on the earth? Well, it's not a stretch to say that in the same way that Jesus went out of his way to have fun and celebrate people and enjoy his life and bring energy into every room that he walked into, it's not a stretch to say that as his followers, we should have the same reputation. That should follow us as well. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I am so sick of mean and hateful Christians. Anybody else sick of mean and hateful Christians over this period of time? I'm sick of seeing complaining Facebook posts and Instagram posts. I'm sick of... I'm sick of boring, lifeless Christians. I'll be honest with you. I'm sick of it. I don't understand why people equate following Jesus to like hating your life, to like being boring and not trying new things. I'm sick of cynical and bitter Christians. I'm sick of it. We can do better than that. Like that isn't what we've ever been called to do, man. And I can tell, I can tell some of y'all why you haven't, experience success in reaching people for the kingdom. In fact, I can just tell some of y'all why you don't have a bunch of friends. It's because it's because you're not nice. It's because you're mean. It's because you're rude. It's because your life is all about you. It's because you've settled for blah. Honestly, you've, you've settled for vanilla. <laughs> you, you have stopped doing anything new. You've stopped learning any new hobbies. You've stopped making friends with any new people. You've just settled for a boring existence. You have. That's why. Now, don't get me wrong. Is there a time and a place for boring? Of course. Every day there is. Is there a time and a place for silence and solitude? Yes. Is there a time and a place for for mourning and weeping and grieving? Absolutely. Is there a time and a place for confrontation of sin? Most certainly there is. But if Jesus was typically a super happy, super friendly super full of life, and probably super hilarious person, then as his followers, we should also be people who regularly bring life and energy and laughter and enjoyment into every room that we walk into. We, like Jesus, we should be party starters. All that said, we can't stop there because this idea of being party starters, it goes a little deeper than that. In fact, I am reminded of the parable that Jesus told about the prodigal son. It was this kid who made a bunch of bad decisions and he left home on bad terms and then he drug his entire family's name through the mud with him while he, while he does all that stuff. And then eventually he realizes, man, maybe I should go back home because things aren't working out for me real well. And so he does go back home and to his surprise, when he arrives home, even despite his bad decisions, Even despite his mistakes, despite his lifestyle choice, despite all the broken promises that he'd made his family, his friends, and his father, despite all of that, his dad did not kick him to the curb. His dad didn't say, you've made your bed, now you need to sleep in it. His dad wasn't even angry with him. Actually, if you read the story, it says, upon seeing his son 
in the distance, this father takes off running towards his boy. He tackles him and he starts hugging him and kissing him. And before the kid could even finish his speech that he had written to try and beg for his place back into the family, the father already had servants getting ready to throw a party in honor of the fact that his boy had come back home. Now, I just want you to take my word for it. Let's read it real quick. I'm kind of jumping in about halfway through the story here, so just bear with me. Luke 15, starting in verse number 20, it says this. So he returned home to his father. He returned home to his father. The boy returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, say a long, say a long way long. Way off. off. That's important because without Jesus, guess where you stand with God? A long way off. No matter how long you've been going to church, how many Bible verses you know, how much you give in the offering, how, what the kind of songs that you sing, without the love of God, we are all a long way off. And while this boy was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. And not with hate and resentment, but rather with love and compassion. He ran to his son, he embraced him, and he kissed him. And his son said to him, he started to try and recite this speech that he'd already come up with. He said, Father, wait, wait, I've sinned against both in heaven and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father interrupted and he says to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf that we've been fattening. We're going to celebrate this with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and now he's returned to life. He's lost, but now he's found. And so the party began. The party began. He threw a party for his boy. And the reason this parable is so stinking important is because this is not just a story about this kid. The story of the prodigal son is your story. It is my story. It is all of our stories. We've all disobeyed God. We've all fallen short of the standards of God. We all deserve to be kicked out of the family and forgotten about. But because of the mercy of God himself, we have a heavenly father who stands with arms wide open saying, you can come home anytime you want. You've still got a place around my table. And according to Luke chapter 15, every time this occurs, every time this happens, every time a sinner repents and turns back to God, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a full blown party. And so my question is, if heaven is throwing a party when that happens, Shouldn't we be doing the same thing? In case you've ever wondered, this is why I make you shout and clap when people make a fresh start on Sunday mornings. This, this is why we jump and dance during worship. This is why our guest team shows up so early to smile and hug you on your way in. This is why we turn the volume up when we sing. Because every Sunday around here, we ain't just having church. No, no. We're throwing a party. This is a party. And in my experience, good parties aren't full of quiet people and low playing music. At a party, you get loud and you dance and you sing and you have fun and you shout and you enjoy your life a little bit. And every Sunday, every week, this is what we're doing right here. It's a party celebrating people who've come back to God for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Every week, this is a party celebrating the fact that we got to come back to God. Even if you didn't make the decision today, you still celebrate it. Every single week, every week, we celebrate the fact that once we were lost, but now we're found. That once we were dead, but now we're alive. Man, I don't know about y'all, but that's what we're shouting about. That's what we're partying about. Would you stand up on your feet and give God a party-like praise for just five seconds? Come on. I need somebody in here to be a party starter right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you that I was lost, but now I'm found. Woo! All right, now, in just a moment, we're going to celebrate a little bit more through some baptisms. We have some people that came back home that made that fresh start, and we get to celebrate them in this moment right now. We're, we're going to here in just a second, but before they roll this thing up here, before we do that, I want to give anyone in here the opportunity who needs it to give you the same chance that the son got 
in this story. A chance to come back to God, the chance to come home, the, the chance to freely experience the love and mercy and friendship and freedom that God offers. Maybe it's your first time. Maybe it's your first time in a long time. But today, if you know you need to say yes to Jesus, or maybe you just need to make a recommitment of your faith, I want to give you that chance here in just a moment. And what we're going to do is we're going to pray. And we're going to pray out loud and all together, but up front. And I say this every week. This prayer is not the end of your journey with God. It is not the climax of your journey with God. It is the beginning of your journey with God. We do not say this prayer just so that when we die, we don't end up separated from God. We say this prayer as an act of giving every moment of our lives over to Jesus. Every decision, every attitude, every second, every dollar, every response, every Sunday, every day over to God and his purpose for our lives. And so if that is you today and you're ready to go all in and give him everything and receive his mercy and his goodness and his love, if you're ready to be born again, if you're ready to experience the regeneration of getting to step into the new life that God has for you right here and right now, then I want you to pray this out loud with me as we pray this all together. So with eyes closed all across the room, just so you can focus not because I want people to be able to do this in secret, just so you can focus. Because sometimes when your eyes are open, you're looking around and you're concerned about everybody else. I just kind of want you to be concerned about you right now. Let's pray this out loud for the sake of everyone that's coming to God for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Here we go. Jesus, I love you. And I give everything to you. My life belongs to you. I choose to go all in. I believe that you're God's son, that you're the savior of the world. I believe that you lived a sinless life, that you died on the cross, and that you rose from the grave. And in response to that, I give you everything. My life is now your life. Here it is, all of me. And I receive your goodness, your grace, your life, and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. On the count of three, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it and you made a fresh start with God, we're going to celebrate that decision. And so on the count of three, if that was you, I want you to shoot your hand up wherever you are. One, two. Three, come on. Anybody in the room? I made a fresh start with God. I see you. I see you. That's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. And if you're watching online and you made a fresh start with God today, or you're sitting in this room, today we're not going to have a prayer team come forward or anything like that. But I want to encourage you to reach out and talk to somebody. You got a lot of work to do now. You got a lot of work in your community. You got some discipleship decisions to make, and we want to be right there with you through those moments. Come find me. Come find one of our leaders. Come find someone on our team. Talk to them. Let them pray with you. Tell them about what happened. If you're watching online, I encourage you to reach out and do the same thing. Hey, everybody. So, number one, I hope that you are all enjoying the most recent part to the Stronger, Better Core series. I know it's been good for me. I know our church is really enjoying it. And if you are, then number two, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page, to follow us on Instagram, or to like us on Facebook. And then number three, if you want to give it to the move of God happening here at Overflow, you can do so via our website or via the Overflow app. Have a great day.